Konnichiwa, and welcome to Japanorama. You know, sometimes Japan gets a bit of a bad rap for being a little, well, cliquey. Like it's some exclusive club with 127 million members, all secretly ostracising you with cruel and cutting epithets, like calling you Mr Floppy Hair, for example. But not only does it seem that foreigners are strictly persona non likey here, even natives who stray a bit from the norm are regarded with the kind of revulsion that us level-headed Brits normally reserve for soap star love rats. Of course, it's being Japan, they have a word for these non-members, which is... Gaijin! And that means... Outsiders! That's right. Gaijin is commonly taken to refer to foreigners, but the term can also apply to outsiders within Japan. Those rare Japanese who have chosen to dance to a different kodo drummer. Here on Japanorama tonight, we take you inside the outside. So stick around with old floppy hair sand here. For centuries, Japan kept a closed door to the outside world. Christian converts were persecuted, and anyone called being foreign was subject to the death penalty. In 1854, Commodore Perry of the US Navy turned up with a fleet of gunships and forced Japan to trade with the West. This brought about a phenomenal exchange of ideas that helped shape the modern world. Culturally, Japan has always held a romantic view of the outsider, whether in cinematic celebrations of the Yakuza, gangsters, or that classic Japanese icon, the samurai. The ultimate outsider character is the Ronin, or masterless samurai. Tough characters who take the lance from freelance and will snap it off right in your hoo-ha. The modern Ronin was celebrated in this classic, Akira, which introduced the world to the excitement of anime. Akira was based on real-life motorcycle gangs that, back in the 70s and 80s, became a threat to the obedient status quo of the nation. If you are going to be one of the most ferocious and anti-social movements ever seen within Japan, then you might as well have a good name. Take the Bosu Zoku, or Ferocious Running Tribe. Now that's a pretty good name. These are the Bozo Zoku, Japan's notorious motorcycle gang. For over 30 years, the Bozo Zoku ruled the highways with their really annoying sounding motorbikes. At their peak, there were over 110,000 members across Japan. <laughs> They caused havoc and panic in the streets, fighting and fottling their way around the country. Boom, boom. The police and the Bosozoku were seen on one level as enemies. They were in conflict with the police, the natural enemy. When young people roam in groups of several hundred people, there would always be accidents. There were always people who would get into fight and fall off, get injured or even die. The Boso Zoku were made up of kids who couldn't fit into society, kids who ran away from home, from abusive parents or maybe got messed up on drugs. The Japanese establishment got worried. In order to understand why these boys join, we need to send someone in to spend time with their family. The Bozo Zoku were like a family. The misfits galvanized into an army of renegades, frightening and threatening and sticking their fingers up at regular society. These gangs were the kings of the road, born to be wild. When I was small, I really admired them. But when I joined, I really enjoyed the riding and the fighting. Even though the gangs lived as outsiders, they still had a code they abided by and a rigorous hierarchy. We are both Suzuki. Our seniors teach us, so we have respect for them. There's no one else we respect. 
The Bozozoko is a vertically structured system. You have to do what your seniors tell you to do. If something is black and they say it's white, it must be white. The biggest concern to society was that the Bosozoku were becoming a recruiting ground for the largest and most dangerous gang of them all, the Yakuza. I wouldn't say there was no connection at all between the Yakuza and Bosozoku. If someone wants to become a Yakuza, then they will. But just because someone does something bad, it doesn't mean that they will become a Yakuza. Sadly, or happily, depending on which side of the road you're on, the Bosozoku are pretty much over now. The endless police hounding and government legislation has made it impossible for the gangs to continue riding out. Two years ago, it was decided by law that if there were more than two bikes riding together, it was thought to be dangerous. Then it could be reported as a crime. Virtually all that is left is a monthly magazine that wheels out a few members for a photo shoot and a nice reminisce about the good old days. And then they push their bikes away. So, what do the kids do for kicks on the street now? They do this. And this. And this. It's called drifting. It's illegal street racing. And if it were a drug, it'd be one of those really nasty, addictive ones. It's so exciting. It feels like your blood is flowing backwards around your body. If you look away, even for a second, you crash. That's the thrill. The thrill is the sound of the engine and the smell of the burning tires. It takes place in the early hours of the morning in nearly every major city in Japan. Drifting is when you put your car into a controlled skid around a bend at speeds of up to 100 miles an hour. So this is a corner, an L-shaped corner. This is the car. Put a lot of speed and step on the brake and turn the handle. The back end will stick out and you drift. Drifting began in the 80s. The kids would race one another down the mountains. Drifting in the mountains is dangerous, so it's exciting. <laughs> the craze took off, and by the 90s, mountain drifting had spread to the city streets, where kids got their thrills from narrowly missing oncoming traffic. There were these old ladies riding along on their bikes. You have to be careful of that. As the underground drift scene grew, hundreds of fans would come to watch their new heroes perform daredevil antics on the streets. These dangerous late-night displays became a serious hazard, and the police tried to shut it all down. The first guy who spots the police sounds the horn so everyone runs away. As soon as the police arrives, we scatter. There are too many of us for them to catch. They'll chase you for a bit, but if you keep going, they'll stop. Drifting was immortalized in a best-selling manga called Initial D. An anime series followed. Then in 2005, top Hong Kong filmmakers Alan Mack and Andrew Lau produced a live-action movie. It was a number one smash all across Asia. Due to immense public and police pressure and its growing popularity around the world, drifting is leaving the streets and becoming a track sport known as D1 racing. And this is the man behind it all. He's Mr. Suchia, otherwise known as the Drift King. He's a legend in the drifting world. He should be. He started it. When everyone in Japan was drifting on the streets, he taught them how to do it properly. 
The Drift King, Mr. Tsuchiya, is God. He is in total control of his car, like God. I started it 30 years ago and established this culture. When driver skill improved, I thought about turning it into a professional sport. He now makes drifting DVDs that are so popular, he releases one a month. They each sell about 50,000 copies around the world. Some fans get the wrong idea, and instead of practicing in an enclosed environment like the circuit, they do it on public roads. This upsets me. They should think of the consequences and not try drifting in the residential area or in busy traffic. From hindsight, I should have stressed this in my videos from the start. Considering how insanely dangerous street drifting is, it's with both excitement and a certain amount of relief that we look forward to its transformation into a controlled track sport. Drifting is coming from Japan to the rest of the world. Drifting is awesome! <laughs>
you couldn't get any further outside than Yayoi Kusama, who many regard as Japan's and possibly the world's greatest living artist. Her work has influenced the avant-garde for over three decades. She's now being celebrated in major exhibitions around the world. Ignored for most of her life, she's finally gaining acceptance in her own home country. Japanese museums didn't even look at my paintings in the past, but not because I'm famous or over the world. They even go all the way to America to buy it. Her life's work has revolved around something that might seem small and inconsequential. But in Kusama's hands, it becomes as significant as the universe itself. There are infinite dots in this universe. The stars are dots, and we are all dots. You are a dot. You are a dot. I am a dot. There are lots of countries, and they are all dots. Kusama has spent her life with dots, from horses, to humans, from clothes to clouds, from cats to concrete. Kusama has placed dots on everything. Her dotiness began at an early age. When I was about seven, I was drawing a picture of my mother, and I saw lots of dots. I was most likely hallucinating. And I decided to develop that into art. Throughout her life, Kusama's had intermittent bouts of mental illness and has often spent time in hospital for treatment. But that's never stopped her work. I had psychological worries and imagination, and we tried to work on that through art. Kusama grew up in the shadow of the bomb. She had an unhappy childhood and lost herself in her paintings. My family were against me painting, so I used to write and draw in secret. From the age of 12, Kusama drew up to 300 pictures a day, many of an unconventional nature. There was no understanding of new art, so instead of sending messages to small Japan, I decided to send it to the entire world. Rejected in Japan, Kusama went to America in 1957, where she joined the avant-garde scene and met a young commercial illustrator named Andy Warhol. Andy is very famous now and left his name, but back in the day, it was very difficult for him. It was difficult for me too. In 1965, she started staging spontaneous happenings around New York, including Wall Street and Central Park. These happenings became part of Kusama's Love Forever philosophy, an early protest against the Vietnam War. In America, during the Vietnam War, I organized lots of anti-war movements. It's because of my childhood that I hated war so much. Kusama's happenings consisted of body painting and public orgies. She documented these events in an experimental film called Self-Obliteration, a concept based on her famous dot theory. Self-obliteration. If you stick yourself a dot onto all the other dots, my life will disappear into these dots into infinity. And now as she approaches her 80th year, Kusama is as prolific as ever with galleries around the world clamouring to show her work. Being an outsider has clearly paid off. I don't have any regrets. Oh, but before I went to America, I burned 2,000 of my own pictures behind my house. I thought I want to create much better art. I regret burning these 2,000 pieces of art. They are most likely fantastic. I wanted to make something even better. Kusama-sensei, we think you did. Although most of us probably think of Japan as a nation connected by the world's most punctual and reliable train system, they still attach quite a lot of romance to the lure of the open road, especially the life of the Japanese truck driver. Truck drivers are archetypal outsiders the world over, and Japanese truckers are no exception. Life on the endless highway can get pretty dull, so one of the more artistic drivers came up with a great idea, literally to paint his wagon.
and in typical Japanese style, other truckers copied him. Now there were events where truckers from all over Japan gather to flaunt their art. Hi, my name is Hamada, and this is my truck, Yushinmaru. We design our own trucks to express individuality. You can make whatever you want. That's the great aspect of Japanese art trucks. They portray anything and everything, from anime characters to kamikaze war heroes. Not forgetting the ideal fantasy woman. The woman on the back watches me as I drive. It's comforting to have a woman on the back. My wife wasn't very pleased about that. And she wouldn't be too pleased if she knew how much he'd spent on it. These works of art don't come cheap. Cost me around 12,800 pounds, I guess. Inside, I've got two chandeliers. I think I spent about 5,000 pounds on the inside alone. I spent over 42,000 pounds just on the decoration. These truckers don't paint their trucks themselves. They take them to someone they can trust with their vision. This is Hashimoto, one of Japan's top truck artists. In fact, he's the Michelangelo of the moving art world. It will take him all day to do this sign. Doing a truck isn't just a walk in the park, you know. I draw on three sides a week, seven days. It takes a week to do it. The three-sided painting in the background portrays good luck and is very popular amongst the truckers. A trucker's life is an outsider's life in every way. And when you spend weeks alone, you get time to reflect on your outsider existence. When you feel lonely and you're getting in a truck on your own, you feel even lonelier. As you are all alone, when you are driving, no one knows if you cry. So I cry with my sunglasses on. Trucking isn't all tears and tissues. There's a romantic side to this modern-day samurai, slicing through the countryside like a roaming ronin. A nicely decorated truck can be as attractive to the ladies as a big swollen red arse is to a randy baboon. At petrol stations, sometimes girls wave to you because these trucks are very flashy. In Fukui, she was there. We got on well and traveled together for a week in this truck. We slept together in the bedroom in the back and popped into public bars on the way. We ate convenience store meals or local specialty food when we were in tourist places. Then we ended up getting married. And just when you thought it was all over, when the night has fallen and everyone's going home, you get this. A light show that any club in Brighton will be proud of. But if Japanese disco pop is not your cup of tea, and it certainly isn't mine, you don't have to walk far to stumble onto something more underground. The greatest band you'll ever listen to. I love this. It was like, bang, this, this is what music should be like. Enjoy it and play. You know? Electric Eel Shock is like the James Browns of heavy metal. For the past two years, Electric Eel Shock has been wowing audiences from Pittsburgh to Preston with their heavy metal antics. But first, they had to suffer rejection at home. Nothing happened in Japan for us. <laughs> we decided, oh, Japan is not our country. <laughs> at a time when Japan was more keen on hip-hop and J-pop, Electric Eel Shock were true outsiders. And like the Ronin before them, they hit the road in search of acceptance. And they found it in jolly old England. 
Mile End in the East End of London, to be precise. Mile End. In the London. In the London, Mile End. Where they quickly grasp the essence of our British way of life. Everybody going to going to a pub and drinking. Very drunk. Yeah, be or be with the drunk. Yeah, but it's different culture. You should know that. Drinking and jelly deals, the perfect combination for a band that got its name from the long slithery sort. One day I went to fishing and got electric gear, so I touched shock. I got shock, electric shock. That's why I named electric gear. Mm. Show you heavy metal. Come on. All jellied up, they continued their tour of the world, returning to Japan as heroes. Hey, everybody, look at me. Having found fame abroad, Electric Eel Shock is finally ready and able to deliver its heavy metal message to Japan. We are doing more things in Japan, so I hope to, uh, that it will be an equal in Europe and America or some other countries. I think we've proved tonight that even if Japan isn't exactly whammer jamma with rebels and outsiders, the ones they do have are exceptionally good value. But what have we learned? Ancient Japanese knock-knock joke for you. Knock-knock. Who's there? Gaijin. Gaijin who? Gaijin, from your response, you haven't recognised my voice. Oya sumanasai. Good night. If you've been loving our night of back-to-back -back comedy, it's just set to continue now, as on the way next, it's a double bill of the excellent American Dad.